Hi, I'm Lucy Lacanienta, Research Assistant for the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and I'm here today with Jeff Cannon. Jeff is a research associate at the Neely Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship, where his current projects explore African readings of scripture through their use of the Book of Mormon. More broadly, his research focuses on local manifestations of Christianity and their relationship to the worldwide church. He is a PhD in World Christianity from the University of Edinburgh, an MA in Church History and Church Polity, from the University of Pretoria, and a BA in Political Science from Brigham Young University, where he also completed a minor in African Studies. Previously, he was an archivist for the Church History Library and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, specializing in historical images. His work has appeared in edited collections, peer-reviewed journals, and other online publications. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Our scripture block for this week includes Jacob chapters five through seven, and we'll primarily be focusing on the allegory of the olive tree that is found in chapter five. Along with those scriptures, we'll take a look at this woodcut relief print by Brian Kershiznik, an active artist in Utah. This print was made in 2017, along with a number of others for the Book of Mormon Brief Theological Introduction series. So I think it's interesting how the lines in this piece seem to cut at each other. In the background, we have the lines of the clothing all going in one direction, and then we have this diagonal from the branch going in another. And to me, that seems to be highlighting this cutting aspect of the process of grafting. How do you see this piece interpreting Jacob chapter five and the surrounding scriptures? Well, I think one of the interesting elements of this piece, you know, it's called grafting. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we think of grafting, we think of bringing two parts of a plant together. But what the, the artist has portrayed here is actually the, the cutting element of that mm -hmm. and cutting something off before you attach it someplace else. And this is really important to the Nephite experience where they've been cut off from the rest of Israel as, as Lehi and Sarai at the beginning of the Book of Mormon heed the Lord's command that they take their family mm -hmm. away from Jerusalem. And this sort of creates a, a, a sort of an existential crisis for the Nephites as they're always constantly wondering throughout the Book of Mormon, where do we fit into all of this? So in this context of this existential crisis mm -hmm. of the Nephites, um, this image shows us this, this being cut off and then things being brought back um, through this process of grafting. And this is an important uh, part of a theme that actually Nephi introduces earlier in the Book of Mormon talking about how the gospel uh, can go toward all kindred nations and tongues. So this is a, mm -hmm. a phrase that we see a lot in the Book of Mormon. So it's, that's part of the, the broader message of the book. Uh, and really this image, although it's uh, used uh, in in the, the study edition of the Book of Mormon uh, for Jacob, and it's also the cover for the, mm -hmm. the Jacob volume for the Brief Theological Introduction to the Book of Mormon series. It really could be used to illustrate several aspects of the Book of Mormon, or the Book of Mormon really as a whole. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So in Jacob chapter 5, another theme that we see is the Lord's desire to continually nourish every branch and every tree in the vineyard. How do you see that in relating to what you've studied regarding the reception of Christianity and specifically in Africa? I'm, I'm first of all struck by your use of the word nourish because we see that word nourish several times in the allegory and we also see that word in other places in the Book of Mormon. Specifically, Alma uses that mm -hmm. uh, in Alma 32 where he's using his own sort of horticultural analogy yeah. uh, about the seed being related to the Word of God. Uh, but I'm also specifically interested in it in the context of Moroni talking about the Nephite church and how new members of the church's names were taken so that they could be nourished by the good word of God. And of course, mm -hmm. we often associate the, the phrase word of God with the scriptures and the, and the texts of the scriptures. Uh, in 2022, the church news uh, reported that of the 115 languages that the Book of Mormon had been translated into, mm -hmm. 16 of those were African languages, mm -hmm. and there were two more languages that were in the process of being translated at the time. So we're starting to see a fulfillment of this prophecy uh, that we see in the Book of Mormon about uh, languages, uh, every person being able to, every nation being able mm -hmm. to uh, preach the gospel in their own tongue. And we see similar language in uh, the Doctrine and Covenants about that as well. In uh, addition to African languages, we're starting to see more and more African leaders uh, and, and missionaries that are going uh, into Africa, they're coming from Africa mm -hmm. itself. Uh, the Africans are teaching their own people. Now, 
the first missionaries that were assigned to Africa were sent in 1852 and they arrived in 1853. Uh, all three of them were American. Mm -hmm. Not one of them was, was African. Uh, obviously, uh, they were primarily working with the white community in Southern Africa. Um, but there were some, some native uh, black Africans that were baptized at the time. Uh, and the, the first mission president, Jesse Haven, actually starts to call local brethren to serve in uh, sort of short-term missions to nearby towns and villages. Mm -hmm. um, but he also writes to Brigham Young, uh, and he suggests that the missionaries that are called in the future be local brethren, uh, most likely those who have emigrated and, yeah. and come to Salt Lake, and then they'd be sent back. Uh, and actually, we do start to see that with the next group of missionaries that come. Mm -hmm. Today, we have more and more Africans that are serving uh, as elders and sisters in these missions. And uh, a lot of the leadership are, are Africans, um, mission presidents and their wives. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, of the, the six temples that are currently in the, African, uh, the church's African areas, five of them uh, have mission presidents and matrons who are local Africans. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's part of that, that that's happening. Uh, we have a tendency to think about uh, Africa receiving the gospel from Western missions mm -hmm. and missionaries. Uh, but that's not entirely true. What we actually see, uh, we see Philip uh, in the book of Acts yeah. who's, who baptizes an Ethiopian eunuch. Mm -hmm. Probably uh, he was Nubian or what we would today call uh, Sudan. Uh -huh. uh, and there have been Christian communities in Sudan for centuries. We also see uh, Christian communities uh, in, in Ethiopia mm -hmm. uh, and Jewish communities in those areas as well. They're you know, centuries old and they have mm -hmm. long traditions of Christianity. Uh, and those are sort of uh, another uh, example of these branches that have been cut off and that the Lord continues to uh, to nourish them and take care of them in his own way. Mm -hmm. um, when we do get to the Western missionary enterprise uh, that starts really in the 18th century, gets going really in the 19th century, um, that, that missionary enterprise is really in a lot of ways seen as a failure because there aren't a lot of African converts. It's not until the 20th century when African Christians start to take over the operations of the missions uh, and more responsibility for, for um, uh, administering the local churches. This is, we're talking about the Protestant churches and the mm -hmm. Catholic churches that we see an explosion uh, of Christianity in Africa. So the, the Pew Center re, uh, estimates that in 1910, at the beginning of the 20th century, something like 9.1% of Africans were Christians. By 2010, uh, 100 years later, we're mm -hmm. looking more like 67% wow. of Africa are Christians. So we've got this huge growth in Christianity. Mm -hmm. And at the same time in the, in the West, where that used to be sending uh, mm -hmm. missions and missionaries to Africa, and they still are in a lot of cases, uh, but, at, but Europe in particular is sort of secularizing. And so we're starting to see what we call reverse mission, where we've got Africans who are sending missionaries to Europe, oh. uh, which is uh, having a, a, a much smaller Christian population than they used to. Very interesting. Those are great insights on sort of the fulfillment of these prophecies that we're seeing in our day. Thanks. And let me just continue on yeah. that as well. So uh, we're starting to see that uh, in the Latter-day Saint tradition as well, mm -hmm. with the calling of general authorities who are coming from Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many of the Latter-day Saints have been blessed by hearing uh, Joseph Satati or Edward Dubé speak in general conference, or even here on BYU campus, Julia mm -hmm. Mavimbella uh, came many years ago and spoke at, at women's conference. So we're starting to see this grafting in of mm -hmm. these branches that have been dispersed in other places in the vineyard as well. Absolutely. So you've done some work in the past with other LDS images. Um, how can you contextualize this piece within the greater discussion of LDS art and theology and writing? Um, one of the things that I find interesting about this image uh, is this idea of it, of it being grafting and, um, and, and cutting, but uh, particularly this one is there's this focus on the hands. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this, this series of images that was t done by Brian Kershiznik, uh, that was a conscious effort on Kershiznik's part yeah. to focus on hands. And hands are a symbol of action and work. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is showing us sort of the work of, of what's happening. In other images in this series, we see hands that are writing scripture or mm -hmm. they're giving blessings or, or doing things of, of that nature. One of the really I think, poignant images uh, is the, the hands of Christ that are being held out yeah. for the Nephites to, to see and to witness for themselves. And these are hands that have done work. Mm -hmm. They're hands that have done the work of the atonement. They were nailed to the cross and they bled from every pore in Gethsemane, which itself is another olive 
yeah. Garden of Olive Trees. Uh, and this image, you can kind of see it a little bit. Uh, that it does appear to have what appear to be the scars of the crucifixion. Um, mm -hmm. Now that's that's slight, and I think that's intentional on, on the on the artist's yeah. part uh, to say, well, maybe they're there, maybe they're not. Kind of mm -hmm. depends on if you're going to see uh, see what's there. Yeah, that is beautiful. Thank you. Can you share any personal reactions that you've had to this piece or to these scriptures that we've looked at? I um, my personal reaction. One of the first things that I notice about this, and I find very interesting and mm -hmm. poignant about this, is that this is an engraving. Um, yeah. And the Book of Mormon, of course, was engraved. Uh, so the, the process of making a woodcut and the process of, of engraving on plates are probably very different. I've never done either mm -hmm. one. But if we look at, if we go back to Jacob chapter 4, uh, which in the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon was part of the same chapter with, with this allegory okay. that comes from Zenos, um, Jacob tells us how difficult it is to engrave anything on plates. And so he says, mm -hmm. we're only engraving the most important things. And then he proceeds to engrave Zenos' allegory, which turns out to be the longest chapter in the entire Book of yeah. Mormon. So clearly this is something that Jacob sees as being very important. And mm -hmm. actually, I think we can see that other Nephite prophets are seeing the import here. We, we first meet Zenos, at least by name, mm -hmm. uh, in 1 Nephi chapter 19, where Nephi is talking about the signs that are going to be given of Christ's death. Uh, particularly to those who are on the Isles of the Sea, he says. So people all over the world are going to have this witness that Christ has come and that he has died. Uh, and some of those people are part of the house of Israel, but some of them also, based on, on what Nephi gives us of what Zenos is talking about, mm -hmm. seem to not be familiar with the covenant and the God of Israel. Uh, so probably people outside uh, of Israel. Um, throughout uh, Zenos's, you know, words that we get in the Book of Mormon, and we get mm -hmm. them again from Alma as well, and, and we see sort of traces of them in Lehi and even Moroni. So we go from the beginning to the end, Zenos shows up over and over again, sometimes by name and sometimes not. But consistently he seems to be interested and uh, concerned with those who have been separated in some way, okay. cut off, uh, as this image shows, yeah. from the main Israelite population centers. Uh, and Zenos is concerned with them, and he's showing the Lord's concern with them mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and so as, a, as a, a scholar of world Christianity, I really see this image, uh, and particularly this chapter, as being one of the great contributions that the Restoration, and particularly the Book of Mormon, uh, contribute to uh, world Christianity, the study of world Christianity as a worldwide religion. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you. I love that you brought up that this is an engraving. It brings to mind the language of the scriptures where we are engraved on the palms of Christ's hands. Yes. So that's perfect. So. Do you have any other thoughts you'd like to share with us? No. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.